blue. I don't thank her often enough. Thank you, Katie Ballou, the lovely bride of Jake Ballou, for she is our church secretary, and uh, she prints off the bulletins and a lot of other stuff. And uh, so I'm really grateful for them. Thank you for the music team. Yes. Yes. Thank you for the music team as well, who is faithfully coming in here and practicing. And, you know, we are so blessed here at Shiloh. It is considered on average, in the average church, that you get about 20% participation in, uh, you know, 20% of the people are doing most of the work. And oftentimes that number is even lower. Here at Shiloh, I have no doubt that that number is significantly higher. I've never crunched the numbers, but I'll bet it's at least double. I bet it's 40% of the people in here that are at work doing some kind of ministry work, some kind of teaching, um, you name it, cleaning, uh, doing inventory in the fellowship hall, bringing food for events and so forth and so on. It's, I'm just very grateful. God has blessed us. I thank you that you are a blessing even as you are blessed. So praise God. And I want to thank in advance as well Ashley Parker for her work in heading up the Family Fun Fair coming up on September 14th. All right, now let's get into this. We continue through the book of Acts, and as you can see, Acts part 27. So let's just jump right in. Now about that time, Herod, the king, laid hands on some who belonged to the church. Let's stop right there for a moment. Herod. This is kind of a joke. I've heard it been brought up in Bible studies through the decades. Herod. Now which Herod is this? There is a Herodian dynasty that began with Herod the Great. You know, that really bad dude that kicked it all off around the time Jesus was born and he heard about and you hear about him during the Christmas story sometimes at Christmas time and you he, this is the guy that had all the boys 2 years and younger in the Jerusalem area murdered because he did not want this king of the Jews to come up and be his competition interestingly enough uh, not only did he not get Jesus obviously but that in a manner of speaking, caused Jesus to stand out even more. And also, shortly after Jesus' birth, Herod the Great wasn't very old, he died. And uh, there's a whole bunch of Herods and Herodias and all that stuff through the Bible. This, through the New Testament, excuse me, this Herod is Herod Agrippa I. He is the grandson of Herod the Great. And I could go into lots of details that maybe you don't care about. But here's something that you want to know is Herod Agrippa I, who is what we're talking about here, he was essentially a tetrarch. He is, they call him king and so forth. His father was killed by his nasty grandfather when he was only three years old. So... He didn't exact, exactly live the life of Riley. He didn't exactly have an easy life himself. And in fact, um, we'll get into it a little bit more in a couple of minutes, but uh, uh, he, he's kind of an interesting character. He went to Rome. He, spent, he grew up in Rome, actually, b in order to be under some protection. He knew the, the Caesar family, if you will. He grew up with Claudius. And uh, so he had rubbed elbows and grown up with the Caesars, the ones who became Caesar later on. But when he left Rome um, as an adult, he had, <laughs> he had incurred a whole lot of debt and just got out of town without paying people. So he also made a lot of enemies. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church. Well, to, to, why? To do them harm. And he had James, the brother of John, executed with the sword. Now, here's again, we've got to stop and say, all right, there are a few Jameses 
in the New Testament. This James, obviously the brother of John, the sons of Zebedee, James and John. You remember that the three inner circle with Jesus was Peter, James, and John, 12 apostles. But for the really small group stuff <laughs> that Jesus was really doing perhaps a bit more close hands-on discipling, and that's what he was doing, he was discipling Peter, James, and John more intensively than the other 12 apostles because they had a major leading role, and Jesus knew in advance, of course, what their major leading roles were. You also remember that James the son of, and John were called the sons of thunder. Remember there was one point that we, when we were going through the Gospel of John that James and John came to them and said, came to Jesus and said, you want us to call fire down on, these, <laughs> on this village and wipe them all out? And uh, I'm paraphrasing quite a bit here. Um, I, Jesus sort of went, uh, whoa, Nelly, pull, pull back on the reins there a little bit, boys. Okay, Jesus didn't say those words at all. I'm really, really, I'm, I'm go doing worse than the, than the message and in inventing new words there. But he corrected them, needless to say. So, next verse. Oh, by the way, executed uh, John, uh, James with the sword. He was beheaded. Let's put it in plain language here. Let's go to a cross-reference. Mark 10, verse 39. This is Jesus in the yellow words. They said to him, we are able, meaning they wanted to take the cup. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you shall drink, and you shall be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized. He's not talking about being dunked in water. The cup that Jesus and they are speaking of, well, they don't know they're speaking of it, that Jesus was going to be baptized with, the, with his death on the cross, okay? That's what he was speaking of here. And in fact, he was foretelling when he said, the cup that, you, that I drink, you shall drink. In other words, that they too were going to be executed, okay? The, the cup, or at least James was. And now what we're seeing with James being executed early on, he was in fact the first apostle to be executed, he was the first apostle to die. Now, Stephen was not an apostle. Stephen was what? A deacon. Okay? He was the first martyr, but the first apostle to be executed was James. Now, this signals to you, and should signal fairly clearly, that this is the ramping up of persecution. There is a political atmosphere. We talk about context here. Politics are involved. If you think that having the powers that be utilize all the powers of the state to make life miserable or even take the imprison or take the life of their political enemies is something new, I want to stand corrected. It goes back almost since the beginning of human civilization. This took place roughly 1,980 years ago. So it's been a few minutes. The cup that I drank, James was killed. So Jesus is foretelling that. Now we get back to verse 3. When he saw that it, was, that it pleased the Jews, saw that who, what, who, what are we talking about here? We're going back to Herod Agrippa I. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter as well. All right? When, remember, like it was in the, in the Gospels, the Gospels frequently spoke of the Jews. When they're speaking of the Jews, they're speaking of the Jewish leadership, the leaders of first century Judaism, and those who are under their influence. Now, mind you, it has been a while. The friendliness, whatever, once the Christians were once uh, considered to be part of Judaism, now they have been clearly separated from Judaism. They're considered a separate uh, cult, if you will. They were being considered as a cult to the Jews in those days. And they were being preached against on a regular basis, just like with political opponents nowadays constantly saying bad things about each other. The very same thing is going on in this particular case. And so, King Herod, Agrippa I, he wants to score some political points. He wants to make nicey-nice with the, the, 
the seats of power. And the seat of power in Jerusalem is the Sanhedrin, the, the, made, the big council of Judaism. So he wants to make them happy. So he's killed James, and, and they're very happy. They're doing the hoorays. Great job. We love you. And uh, so he goes, well, it looks like this is going to be good for me. Maybe I should just keep on killing more of these guys. I guess I'll go get Peter next. So these were the days of unleavened bread. What's that? Passover season, right? Roughly equal to the season where we are, we're celebrating Easter. So he arrests Peter. But it's the days of unleavened bread. So when he had him, when he had arrested, slow down, Stan. Take a deep breath. I'm stumbling over myself. When he had arrested him, he put him in prison, turning him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. That, folks, is what we call high security. High security. Uh, four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending only after the Passover to bring him before the people. Passover is a very, very busy season. He doesn't want to do it while everybody's busy with other stuff. He wants to wait until things calm down a bit so he can be the main show. He can bring Peter out in, on this public show trial before executing. Now, mind you, he probably has no intention it's going to be quite similar to the time when Jesus was bought, brought before tribunals publicly. They couldn't find anything to charge him with. They killed him anyway. Okay? This was not the system of jurisprudence you and I are used to. So, four squads. Each squad is made up of four men. They're taking shifts. Two of these men, two of these soldiers, they may have been Roman soldiers, but Herod Antipas, though he may, they may have been following Roman army protocol here, these are not necessarily Roman soldiers because Herod Antipas I had his own army. But I guarantee you, or maybe I shouldn't say that that strongly, they were following Roman protocol, and you'll see why in a minute. So, turning him over to these four squads of soldiers, intending to bring him out only after Passover, bringing him before the people. Verse 5, so Peter was kept in the prison. But prayer for him was being made to God intensely by the church. James has already been executed. Do you think that the church that knows Peter so well, Peter is by far probably the most prominent of the apostles, do you think they are praying fervently for Peter? Do you think there is an intensity to their prayers? You would be correct. They are praying to who? To God. There are a lot of people who think they're praying to God, but in fact, they're really just praying to what God is in their imagination. They're praying to God intensely by the church. This same word, praying, praying intensely, is used in the account of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying with such intensity, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done, and praying in great drops, like his sweat, like great drops of blood. This is very significant intensity. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently. His sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Luke twenty two forty four. Back to Acts 12. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward the following day, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. Now, I know this is a familiar story for those of you who've been around church and reading the Bible for a while, but stick with me, will you? How long has Peter been in that prison? It doesn't say specifically, but we know that he was in there for a while. Notice how God doesn't come ahead of time, necessarily, per se. God could have broken him loose the very first day. God could have kept him from getting put in prison. 
But God waited until the very night before. God's timing is always right. We may not think so. But you see, Peter doesn't seem to be bothered, does he? He's just snoozing away. I, for some reason, this story, I, I, don't, I don't even know if the Bible, any cross-reference system, points me back to when they were in the boat and Jesus was sleeping and all the apostles, then disciples, not yet apostles, were in a panic. Jesus, how can you sleep through this? Now, think of Peter in a panic on a boat. These were seasoned fishermen. They hadn't seen a storm quite like this. They don't, didn't see him all the time. These were seasoned fishermen, and they were afraid. Jesus was snoozing in the boat, and they woke him up. Lord, now fast forward many years later, and here is Peter in prison. He knows that he is bound for execution the next day. Does it seem to bother him? doesn't, does it? Why do you think that is? Because he has faith in God. He knows that God is in control. Folks, I want you to remember that all through this book of Acts, and we're going to see it many times, you're seeing it now, you're seeing it in this very chapter, the sovereignty of God. It doesn't matter how many agendas are afoot, the political agenda, the economic agenda, the personal agendas, all of those other agendas cannot even begin to thwart the will of God. All the other stuff you're worrying about in your life, about, oh no, is this going to happen, or is that going to happen, or you name it. Whatever you might be worrying about, stop and consider the fact that your sovereign God knows your name, knows where you are, chose the day you would be born, chose the day you would die, and he knew every single day, every single hour, every single minute in between. I want you to understand that sovereignty. When you come to recognize and realize and actualize in your own minds the absolute sovereignty of our absolute, magnificent, majestic Father in heaven, you will begin to be able to sleep better, just like Peter. So, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, as was the protocol, with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly stood near Peter, and a light shone in the cell. Let me ask you folks, if a bright light suddenly comes on in your dark bedroom, wouldn't you wake up? No? <laughs> there are some heavy sleepers, and there is evidence that Peter was a heavy sleeper. He fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane like the others, except Christ. So a bright light comes on, and what does the angel do? He doesn't go, Peter, Peter. I don't know if he struck him with his foot or his hand, but he had to smack him in the side. And the word there indicates it was with some force in order to wake him up and saying, get up quickly. And so his chains fell off of his hands. We know that that's actually his wrists fell off his hands as he stood up. I'm not getting a response from the clicker. There we go. Cross-reference. Now, again, why is Peter so calm and comfy? Let's read this, John 21, 18. Truly, truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to put on your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow up, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will put your belt on you and bring you where you do not want to go. This is Jesus speaking to Peter. Other translations say, when you are young, you'll go, you put on your belt and go wherever you want, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will put your belt on you and bring you where you... In other words, Peter understood this, we understand this, it's not quite as clear with this particular translation here, but Peter knew, number one, that he was going to be, he was going to die when he was older, and he's not yet old. So I believe he's remembering these words of Jesus I'm not going to die yet. I'm not old yet. 
That's one thing I think. Now, you may not, may not be 100% with me on that, but I, I think you should be. I'm not always right, but often I think I am. <clears throat> Having cast all your anxiety on him because he cares about you, Peter wrote this later on. Hence the book, 1 Peter 5, 7. It looks as though Peter has cast all his anxiety on him, doesn't it? Are you casting all your anxiety on him? Pregnant pause. Awkward pause. Are you casting all your anxiety on him? Do you know that he cares about you? Do you know? Peter also had another reason for having confidence, because if you remember back in Acts chapter 5, Peter was set free then too from prison. All right? So there's a precedent here. Do you remember the times that the Lord has set you free from something? Do you remember the times that the Lord, when you have prayed about something and the Lord has answered your prayers? Remember those times. They will give you the ability to sleep in the hour of danger. Back to verse 8. And the angel said to him, Put on your belt and strap on your sandals. Okay. Basically, he said, Peter, get dressed. Now, I want you to put, put yourself in this picture. I think Peter, this is just my sanctified imagination. I'll call it sanctified imagination. Again, you can disagree with me if you want, but I am picturing Peter standing there, all agrog. He's still not completely fully awake. And the angel says to him, put on your belt and strap on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, now wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Now the Bible doesn't give us the whole thing, but you know, I'm thinking some, some Jewish comedians I, I love to listen to. They say, it's spritzing a little bit outside. You may want to put on a light jacket. I don't know that the angel's saying that, and I'm putting some humor in here purposely because this story has some funny elements to it, and you'll see another one in a few minutes. So he's saying, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow the, and the angel, it doesn't say there, and yet he did not know what was being done by the angel was real. Peter thinks he's seeing a vision. I think he's still in enough of a grog, which is why the angel had to explain all this stuff on getting dressed, that Peter's just sort of... Okay, but he's had visions before, right? Remember the cloak, the, the sheet from heaven and all of that? So he's had these visions before. He's thinking this is a vision. So he went out and continued to follow, and yet he did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Now, when they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate. Now, okay. How is it they're passing by the guards? We don't know. It doesn't say specifically. They just walked right past the guards. Whether the guards had been put to sleep, whether, they, whether Peter's cloak had, been be, had become an invisibility cloak like with Harry Potter, we don't know. But they just walked right past the guards. God's supernatural power, his sovereignty is on display here. If you ever have doubts about whether God can fix your problem, remember this story. Okay? Think about it. Have peace. All right. They came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. You know, they didn't have things that opened gates automatically in those days. They didn't have Bluetooth. They couldn't operate it by the internet. This was supernatural. And they went out and went along one street, where some commentators say about a block, and immediately the angel departed from him. There's no further explanation. The angel's job is done. Poof, he's gone. He's gone as quickly as he showed up. He's done his job. Verse 11, when Peter came to himself, oh, See what I, why I think he was in a grog? When Peter came to himself, in other words, he went, oh, wow. 
He, it was like he had been sleepwalking and what had been having a dream while he was sleepwalking. And he says to himself, and I think this is a humorous element, Peter says to himself, self? I know, dumb old joke. But he's talking to himself. Now I know for sure the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. What does that tell you that the Jewish people were expecting? That's what they were expecting. But they were praying otherwise, but they were sort of expecting. And how do I know that? Let's go on with the story. This story doesn't need that much explanation from me, but that won't stop me from trying. <laughs> yeah, there's a rather unclean comic that said, uh, I had the right to remain silent, but I lacked the ability. And uh, I'm kind of like that. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark. John, who was also called Mark. We're going to hear a little more about him. It seems like everybody in those days had a Roman name, a Hebrew name, a Greek name. They had all kinds of names. And yet with all of those names, a lot of them had the same names. There were lots of Johns and Marks and James and you name it. <clears throat> so this John, who was also called Mark, guess what he wrote? The Gospel of Mark. Where, okay, came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. In fact, in those days, they met in homes, and typically the larger homes, because there were larger gatherings as the church had grown. And so they're gathered in this home of what is apparently a wealthy woman. And uh, so they were gathered together, and they were what? praying. What time of day is it? It's the middle of the night. This is what you might call a special emergency prayer meeting. We don't have a lot of those these days, do we? We put stuff in the prayer chain. We don't have to get together. We can put it out on the Google group email chain, and as soon as you check your email, it's there waiting for you. I do encourage you to participate. You don't have to write comments. Oftentimes I read and I pray, and others do too, and they don't write comments. You don't have to, but if you feel led to do so, you can say you're praying or offer words of encouragement. But this, they're gathering to pray. Now Peter knocks on the door. Let me try that again. He knocks at the door. And it says, a slave woman named Rhoda came to answer. Well, that word, it says slave here. It's not the most literal word for slave. It could mean servant girl. It could mean a young girl. Rhoda, whose name means Rose, she comes to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate but ran in and announced that Peter was in front of the gate so I can picture this young girl. It's Peter! It's Peter! And she runs inside. She doesn't even bother to open the door. She's so excited. It's Peter! You know, she's thrilled. Wow! And just totally unself-conscious, just runs to tell them all with great enthusiasm, Peter's here. The thing we've been praying about for hours and hours has happened. And so they're like, Wow, that's great. Let's go see him. No, that's not what they did. This is a, probably a young girl. And they said to her, you're out of your mind. You've lost your marbles, little girl. They said to her, those things. Not nice either. But she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. Huh? What? Well, there was a belief in those days, and some people still have this belief now, that we all have a guardian angel. Scripture is not crystal clear that we have a guardian angel. It never says explicitly that we do. 
But there was the belief in those days, and many people still have it today, that we have a guardian angel. And that could very well be true. But the belief in those days was that after you had died, your guardian angel or the, your sort of would look like you intentionally and go around and make appearances. Now this, some scholars trace this to a, what they call a deuterocanonical book of the Old Testament called Tobit, where there is an actual angel who apparently takes on the appearance of a human being. But is it relevant? It's kind of, sort of, it it tells you a little bit about where they were at in those days. So they still were holding on to a lot of beliefs that were not necessarily biblical. So the reason I bring that up is we often have a tendency to think in our minds that these first century Christians were super Christians. These were super Christians. We can't be like them. It is so crystal clear, the human element here, the little girl, young lady, whatever it is, being so beside herself with joy, not even remembering to open the door and let Peter in. And then she goes and tells the people, hey, the thing we've been praying about, Peter, he's here. And they're like, get out of here. These people are no more super Christians than you and I are. This story could be told today. And the human nature of it would still be the same. Let's look at a cross-reference. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. It's about prayer. This is the confidence which we have before who? Him. That if we ask anything according to whose will? His will. Who hears us? He hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Are you getting the power of prayer here? The power of prayer. You can have confidence, it says. Verse 16, but Peter continued knocking. Now Peter probably is trying not to knock too loudly because there's neighbors. And He doesn't know how close on his heels those prison guards may be. So maybe he's going, okay, just a thought. It's just a thought. Peter's on the lam, you know. He's on the run. He's a prisoner that's broke free with divine assistance, mind you. So he wants to get inside. He doesn't want to be out on the street where someone might see him. So When they came and opened the door, they saw him, and what? They were amazed. Can you believe it? The thing that we have been praying for so intensely for hours, perhaps days on end, has actually happened. Verse 17. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, Or zip it, zip it, zip it good. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison, and he said, report these things to James and the brothers. Okay, he's not talking about the James that was just executed. That would seem pretty obvious, But since this is a supernatural tale, he's not saying to go have a seance and tell James, the one that was just executed, this story. He's talking about James, the half-brother of Jesus, who was not an apostle, but was a prominent, very devout leader of the Jerusalem church. James, so go tell James and the brothers. Then he left and went where? Where did he go? We don't know where he went. He went another place. He went some other place than there. That's the deepest explanation I can give you. He went some other place. It doesn't tell us where, and it doesn't matter. This is the last we're going to see of Peter. Got that? For the most part, this is the last we're going to see of Peter in this book. So you might ask yourself, hold it. 
why would God choose to have James, the brother of John, allow him to be executed, chopping his head off, and let Peter escape? Well, you could say, well, because Peter had so much more to do. It doesn't show it in this particular book. We know that Peter wrote First and Second Peter. In fact, there's reason to believe that Peter played a major role in the writing of the Gospel of Mark. There are those who believe that. That essentially he dictated much of the story to Mark, who wrote it. There are those who believe that. So he left and went to another place. Verse 18. Now when day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. No small disturbance. In other words, there was quite a ruckus. They were overturning everything looking for Peter. And the final verse for today, when Herod had searched for him and had not found him, he examined the guards and ordered that they be led away to execution. Seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? Seems kind of harsh. You know, it, things were a little more harsh and a little more real in those days, don't you think? Now stuff like happens, they do a review. And they decide, how is it you managed to allow a shot to be taken at the, president, at the former president? Huh? And they spend a month figuring it out and they go, well, we're going to put you on leave for a while. Take a vacation. That wasn't the deal then. You failed. <laughs> well, actually, let's be more specific. The, under the rules then, if you as a prison guard let a prisoner escape, whatever punishment was that prisoner was going to get, you got. So, if their punishment was to get lashes, you got lashes. If their punishment was to be executed, you got executed. It was that simple. So then, Herod Agrippa I, the nice guy that he was, had them executed, and then he went down from Judea to, to Caesarea and was spending time there. What can we learn from this story? We're going to go on and learn a little more about what happens to Herod Agrippa number one. What can you take away from this story today? Well, prayers get answered. God is sovereign. But you know, there are some conditions for prayer to be answered. Number one, that you believe. Uh, scripture says things about uh, if you are walking in habitual sin, God may ignore your prayers. Um, but you pray and believe. I think that they did believe that God was going to answer their prayers to, on some level. But I, you can see very plainly, even in their fervency, even as a group, they had seen the execution of James, and I'm, it seems logical that they would have been praying for James as well, and yet James was executed. So in their minds, they're thinking, God's gonna, got something at work here, and probably Peter will still be executed, but God, that will still be God's will. You know that's true. God is sovereign. If Peter had been executed, it would have been God's will for it to happen. Later on, Peter is executed. In fact, the Gospels, I mean, the, the Bible does not tell us specifically how the other apostles were killed. It's church tradition that tells us that. But let me close this up with this. We read the scriptures on prayer. If you pray according to his will, and you pray with right motive, and you pray believing. You know, as I've said in the previous sermon a couple of weeks ago, God hears your prayers. God knows your name. God is sovereign. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. And he is everywhere. 
I know I'm telling you stuff you already know, but I'm driving home the point because I know some of you have been through some horrendous times in your life. Some of you are going through some challenges now. And I want to remind you, as is the motto on, that Josh has on his t-shirt, Jesus loves you. He really does. He has not left you. He has not forsaken you. He knows what's going on in your life. And he has decreed that the means that he does things is through prayer. You can look at the sovereignty of God and you can ask yourself, well, if God is all-knowing and all, what does he need me to tell him this stuff for? If God is sovereign, he's going to do what he wants, why do I have to bring stuff to him in prayer? Because he says so. Because he's offering you a privilege to be involved in the process. Because he wants, above all, for us to have fellowship with him and with each other. He has decreed it. He has commanded it. He wants us to do this. Do you need more reasons? There are more reasons. You can look them up. The Bible's got a long list of scriptures on prayer. Who, what, when, where, and how, and why to pray. I encourage you to go there. One of my favorite websites that Terry and I donate to from time to time is gotquestions.org. And in fact, they have some good articles on this. All right, let me close. Folks, God loves you. He is sovereign. And he knows every single day of your life. You may stop breathing today. Someone you love may stop breathing today. Maybe someone you love stopped breathing recently. I want you to know how important it is that you not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and that you be willing and know that you are able to share Jesus without fear because it's all about eternity. Let's close. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your love. I thank you I am so grateful that you are sovereign, that there is nothing that is out of your mind or out of your sight. I thank you that by the shed blood of Jesus Christ we can come before you in prayer. I thank you that you have decreed for us a role to play in your eternal and perfect and powerful plan. I thank you, Lord for everything, because you are the blessed controller of all things. I pray, Father, that you would bless the rest, the next service, which is our communion service. Help us to remember what the Lord Jesus has done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.